Good morning. We welcome you from Ottawa, Canada on this Sunday, June 6th. We extend a welcome to those not just watching live, but those of you who will be watching at a later point in time um, from many different parts of the world, not just Ottawa and other parts of Canada, but the US, the UK, Malawi, uh, Venezuela, the Philippines, wherever you are, we extend you a blessing from God. And may he speak to your heart this morning uh, through this message, New Life with New Meaning. I would encourage you to have your Bibles, to have a notebook ready, to have pens to write down what God impresses on your heart or questions that you have. Uh, today as well is Communion Sunday. So we'd encourage you to have juice or water or bread or crackers ready because right after the message, we will be having uh, the communion portion of this service. Uh, we are thankful to continue to be able to come to you remote uh, each week um, with the freedom we have to proclaim Jesus, uh, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace. So before the uh, message today, um, we will have a short prayer that God would anoint uh, myself, uh, his messenger, and that God would speak through this message today, new life with new meaning, in an age when many are turning away from God, in a time when many are professing atheism and a denial of the existence of God altogether. So this is what I would like to address in this message today. And again, may it speak to our heart. Uh, let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray that you will empower your servant today, that this message may come forth with boldness and clarity, and it may build us up in our faith, in our understanding of what it means to have hope when many people are hopeless, what meaning comes in the assurance of the existence of God in the life of individuals, and the hopelessness that comes from a denial of the existence of God altogether. Lord, just speak through this message. I asked in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, we thank God again for being here with you. And we trust that God would speak to you through this message today. New life with new meaning. C.S. Lewis, the Christian author who wrote many challenging books in his book, Mere Christianity, he said the following, atheism turns out to be too simple. Atheism is a belief that there is no God. Atheism turns out to be too simple. If the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. Just as if there were no light in the universe, and therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. So here he is showing the underlying weakness of those who proclaim that God does not exist at all. In an article entitled, Where Are the Honest Atheists? Senior correspondent from the Week magazine, Damon Linker, made the following statement about atheism. He said, If atheism is true, it is far from being good news. Learning that we're alone in the universe, that no one hears or answers our prayers, that humanity is entirely the product of random events, that we have no more intrinsic dignity than non-human and even non-animate clumps of matter, 
that we face certain annihilation in death, that our sufferings are ultimately pointless, that our lives and loves do not at all matter in a larger sense, that those who commit horrific evils and elude human punishment get away with their crimes scot-free. All of this and much more is utterly tragic. It is also a view that has no hope. It is a hopeless view of life. It is a view of life where this time that we spend on earth has nothing beyond that. So we see this position has very little hope or good news based on the view that there is no God. Now, I have, in my opinion, would like to bring forth four reasons for the path taken to atheism. Why are there people who cannot and will not believe in the existence of God. So I'm bringing today uh, four specific reasons for the path taken to atheism. Number one is sin, a desire not to be accountable to God for any actions or attitudes. I visit different websites and often see on some liberal websites many people who are mocking God and mocking those who believe in God. Now, I'm not putting down liberal websites. I'm just saying I have gone to different li liberal websites, liberal in the sense of not the political party, but liberal in the sense of, of orientation of focus. And on some sites, I have seen people who openly mock God, the existence of God, and mock those who even believe that God exists. Now in Psalm 14 and verse 1, Psalm 14 and verse 1, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. <clears throat> so here the psalmist David is saying that those who deny the existence of God are foolish. And in 2 Peter 3.3, 3, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. People will come who will scoff at the mention of the existence of God, who will mock those who believe in the existence of God. In Jude 1 and verse 18, it says, They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. So covering up this belief that there is no God is a desire not to be accountable for the sins in the lives of these individuals. They do not want to be accountable for what they do before God, so they deny the existence of God altogether. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Problem of Pain, said, A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. People can scoff and mock the fact of the existence of God, but that does not deny the fact that God exists. Just because they say he does not exist does not mean that God does not exist. Their words have little value because they have no way to prove that God does not exist except upon the words that they say. <clears throat> There's a reference in a article um, in Ministry 127, and it says, An astronomer, 
astronomer was lecturing a group in France and declared, I have swept the universe with my telescope and I find no God. A musician appropriately rebuked the astronomer. Your statement, sir, is as unreasonable as it is for me to say that a I have taken my violin apart, have carefully examined each part with a microscope, and have found no music. Same reasoning. Sin is number one. People do not want to be accountable to God, so they deny the existence of God altogether. And they mock those who even believe in God because they do not want to be accountable to for their actions before God, so they deny his existence altogether, which in their mind justifies their behavior and their actions. Number one, then, is sin. Number two is suffering. Why people become atheists, why they turn away from God. Suffering. How can a loving God allow suffering? C.S. <clears throat> Lewis again in his book, The Problem of Pain. We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. When things are going great, when things are not in a position of being unsettled, People focus on them, pl their pleasures, people focus on themselves, but when you have conditions of suffering and pain, and we live in a fallen world that has been marred and impacted by sin, it says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We have a world where there is challenges to calamities, where there is challenges through illness, where there are problems through accidents. This gets people's attention when they go through suffering, when they go through pain. It is God's megaphone to raise and rouse a deaf world. In the example of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 verses 1 to 10, Paul, who had been caught up either physically or in a vision to heaven itself and had seen what no other living man had seen. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Paul had a physical affliction, which was so bad that he not only went to ask for it to be removed once or twice, but three times. And Jesus said to him, my grace is made perfect through your weakness. So Paul, in this portion of scripture, in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 10, he said that this affliction, this suffering, this pain, in his case, was given to him and not taken away as a means of humbling him, because he was a very proud individual. He was a very strong-minded person. He was a person of very strong opinions. He had a strong will. He was a Roman citizen. He was a Pharisee. He was trained as a philosopher. He was at the top of his society as a Pharisee, and he had all of these things going for him. So because of his background, because of his training, because of his experience, because of his attitude and nature, his tendency was to become proud. And so he said, this thorn, this physical thorn in the flesh, this affliction had been given to him in order to bring him to humility. So he was not healed. This affliction was not taken away from him. And there are times when God in his sovereign grace does heal people. There are times when God, as Luke was a doctor, works through medical means to bring healing. But there are other times, as in the case of Paul, where there is not healing. But God works through that pain and suffering in that individual 
as they become more dependent upon God through being aware of their weakness through the pain. God works through that affliction more powerfully than if that person had not had that affliction at all. So sometimes there is a definite reason uh, for suffering. In an example from Our Daily Bread, a famous evangelist told the following incident. He said, I have a friend who in a time of business recession lost his job, a sizable fortune, and his beautiful home. So he lost a job, fortune, and home. To add to his sorrow, his precious wife died. Yet he tenaciously held to his faith, the only thing he had left. One day, when he was out walking in search of employment, he stopped to watch some men who were doing stonework on a large church. One of them was chiseling a triangular piece of rock. Where are you going to put that? he asked. The workman replied, Do you see that little opening up there near the spire of the church? Well, I'm shaping this stone down here so that it will fit in up there. Tears filled my friend's eyes as he walked away, for the Lord had spoken to him through that laborer whose words gave new meaning to his troubled situation. We do not know why we go through certain things in this life, but God can work through us. Romans 8.28, all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. So even through the suffering and the difficulties that we face, God can bring glory in it and through the situations we go through as we deepen our dependence upon God. And as we grow in our faith, God can work through the pain and the difficulties that we are going through and touch the lives of others and he can be brought glory and honor through the times that his servants are going through suffering and challenges. We are being prepared for eternity. Sometimes we need to go through the difficult times in order for the aspects of self-centeredness to be worn off, to be chiseled away, so that we can be perfected into the people that God has called us to be. Amen? In Matthew 7, verses 9 to 12, it says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who asked him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. So here we see that God, like a loving Father that we know of from examples here, that how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who asked him? God is not someone who glorifies in suffering, who enjoys seeing people in pain but a loving Father gives the resources for those who are going through the suffering and pain to be able to be victorious. We know in Philippians 4, 13 that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So even when we're going through affliction, we can be overcomers, more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Amen? So some just say, God cannot be a loving God because of suffering, and we need to get rid of all pain. But they do not see that God works through the pain and suffering in order to bring people to a point of a deeper commitment to Him. The city of Nineveh was a city of 120,000 people, and in that city lived enemies of the people of God. So here was a city that was opposed to God. And God sent the prophet Jonah to preach repentance to the city. And Jonah wanted these enemies of the people of God, he wanted them destroyed. 
men, women, boys, and girls. He wanted them all destroyed. No debate. He wanted them the, the city destroyed. So Jonah oh, disobeyed God. He ran in the opposite direction, took a ship to get away from fulfilling what God had called him to do. And God called the, caused the storm. God caused Jonah to be swallowed up in a fish. It took three days for Jonah to overcome his stubborn opposition to God before he said, yes, I will go to, to Nineveh and preach repentance. And he did. And the city repented. The city came to faith in God. And God, in this example, shows his mercy and his grace. He could have destroyed the city. But he gave the opportunity for the people in that city, upon the preaching of repentance by Jonah, he gave the opportunity for the people in that city to repent, to turn away from their sin, to come into a faith relationship with God. So they had an opportunity. They could have been destroyed. God could have poured his judgment out upon that city and destroyed it, but he gave them an opportunity to come in repentance to him, which they did. So we see sin as a reason people can reject God, the existence of God. We see suffering, or people can say God is, is not loving because these people are suffering, therefore God must not exist. Number three, we see in the area of science. Now, science is based upon empirical facts. Science finds and develops and explains the laws of physics that God has already put in place. People can use science to say, well, there is no proof of God because the scientific method has not shown that God exists. And I have read on different sites atheists saying that uh, they need proof that God exists. And they're using this needing proof uh, from a scientific basis as a reason not to believe in God. But I asked you, can God be studied in a test tube? Can God be explained through an experiment? Can a miracle be repeated in order to provide empirical evidence? And the answer is no to all three of these questions. The Israelites, after leaving Egypt, saw the protection, the power, the provision, and the presence of God. Undeniable, undeniable evidence of the existence of God. They saw God's presence. Protection. The parting of the Red Sea, power, the destruction of the army of Egypt, provision, the manna and quail that were provided in the wilderness, presence, God is a cloud at day and is a fire at night. They saw the overwhelming evidence of God and yet still they rebelled and rejected God, even though they had the evidence. People saw the miracles that Jesus performed, evidence of who he was as more than a prophet, but the Son of God. Yet people still did not believe, even though they saw the evidence. So people could even see the evidence, yet refuse to believe in God or be accountable to God. Dr. George Wald, W A L D, who was a Nobel Prize winner in biology and professor of biology at Harvard University, said the following in the book, In Search of Certainty, Josh McDowell and Thomas Williams. So, Dr. George Wald, Nobel, Nobel Prize winner, scientist, he said the following, There are only two possibilities as to how life arose. One is spontaneous generation arising to evolution. So the evolutionary position of how life evolved. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. So he's saying there's only two ex explanations for the existence of life. One, the evolutionary theory. Two, the creation by God. He said there's no third possibility. 
So spontaneous generation, that life arose from non-living matter, was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. That leaves us with only one possible conclusion, that life arose as a creative act of God. So he is saying that of these two possibilities, one's spontaneous generation, that life ar arose by itself spontaneously from nothing, or the creation of life by God, he's saying that there's no evidence for spontaneous generation for evolution now hear hear what he says clearly hear what he says that leaves us with the only one possible conclusion that life arose as a creative act of god now hear what he says i will not accept that philosophically because i do not want to believe in god therefore I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. Spontaneous generation arising to evolution. So here the scientist is saying, the evidence is there for the creation of life by God, yet I will not believe it. I will believe what is impossible, evolution, rather than believe in God because I do not want to believe in God. So here we have someone who has a position opposed to the existence of God, not because the evidence is not there, but because uh, uh, personally, beyond his equipping as a scientist, personally, he did not want to believe in God, so he denied the acceptance of the evidence that he admitted proved the existence of God, but he did not want to believe in God. So there are people today who see evidence even in the world around us, even the evidence that is being brought out through science, who will not believe in God because they do not want to come under the authority of God. C.K. Chesterton, in the quotable Chesterton, said the following, It is observed. For the evolutionist to complain that it is unthinkable for an admittedly unthinkable God to make everything out of nothing and then pretend that it is more thinkable that nothing should turn itself into anything. In Science Moving Toward Belief in God by Paul A. Fisher, he mentions the following. The French mathematician Le Comte de Noir explain the laws of probability for a single molecule of high dissymmetry to be formed by the action of chance. So he's talking about evolution where they say one molecule formed and then other molecules formed and they started life and that life evolved into higher and higher forms of life. Because he's talking about the very beginning. So he looked at the laws of probability that there would be one single molecule formed from chemicals by chance. Dr. Noy found that on an average, the time needed to form one such molecule of our terrestrial globe, one molecule on Earth, would be about 10 to 250 power, in other words, billions of years. But continued de Noor ironically, let us admit that no matter how small the chance it could happen, one molecule could be created by such astronomical odds of chance. Just think, if there was one molecule formed. However, one molecule is of no use. Hundreds of millions of identical molecules are necessary. Thus, we either admit the miracle or doubt the absolute truth of science. So he's talking about the mathematical impossibility or evolution, based upon the looking at the odds as a mathematician. John Glenn, in World Magazine, speaking about his view of the Earth from the Space Shuttle Discovery, said the following, 
to look at the window as I did that first day, to look out at this kind of creation and not believe in God is to me impossible. He saw the glory of God displayed in the creation of God in earth itself as he circled the earth in the space shuttle discovery. In Romans 1, verses 19 to 20, Romans 1, 19 to 20, it says, Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Here, Paul is saying that the creation itself proclaims the existence and the glory of God, and if people deny the evidence that is before him, and we've seen one scientist already that says that evolution is impossible and, and that the existence of God is the option that has the most evidence, and yet he is unwilling to believe in God. So here it is saying that those who take this position have no excuse not to believe in God. Romans 1, 19 to 20. In Psalm 19, verse 1, Psalm 19, verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Every time I see a rainbow, I remember what God said uh, to Noah in giving the rainbow as a covenant that never again would there be a flood. So we see the power and the presence of God in His creation. And those who deny the evidence for the existence of God are without excuse. So we've seen people who, based on sin, do not want to believe in God. We see people who, because of suffering, believe that God is an unloving, judgmental God and do not want to believe in Him. And we see people who use the evolutionary format and evolutionary beliefs in order to justify saying that we cannot believe in God because we cannot prove his existence through the empirical scientific method. There is a fourth reason, and that is saintlessness. Saintlessness, the lack of, of saints being saints, the lack of the people of God being the people that God has called them to be, to be. the church not being the church, and Christians who wear a label but do not live up to it and those who are not of Christ at all. Now, there are people who have been either directly hurt by Christians or who have heard the accounts of greed, sexual or physical abuse committed by Christians or leaders, and outright unchristian behavior, so they have left the church and have left God behind by saying, if if these people follow the Christian God, and yet their behavior is like this, I will not believe in that God. How can I believe in a God whose followers are like that? And we see this happening today with different examples within the church of what has been done by those who proclaim to follow Christ. We see the example of what happened in the residential schools. We see the examples of what has happened with different leaders who had focused on greed and have been kicked out of ministry because of fraud and other actions based on their love for money. People say this is hypocrisy to see those who proclaim Christ who are living in this way. Now, some of it is genuine hypocrisy, and other examples are outright spiritual deception. Some are Christians who give in to the world, who succumb to temptation and enter into sin, 
and live lives that are disobedient to God and are self-centered, but there are other people who are not of God at all and who are wearing the label Christian but are not of Christ at all. In other words, they are false. So there are real Christians who fall into sin and bring dishonor to Christ, and there are others who call themselves Christians who have never been of Christ and who are actively working to discredit the work of God because they are followers of Satan himself. So the first category, and all, all of these examples give people an excuse and a reason to reject the church and to reject God. And this is especially a, uh, something that is happening today. So 1 Peter 2, 15 to 17 says, Do not love the world, and this is speaking to Christians, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Those who surrender to the world, people cannot see the love of God the Father in them because those individuals have become so surrendered to themselves that they can think of nothing else. And their self-focus comes before any concern and compassion for others. For all that is in the world, the lust of the, of the of the flesh, sexual sins, and the lust of the eyes, material greed, and the boastful pride of life. I want to be served instead of being a servant. All of this is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Those who wear the label Christian, but who give in to sin, give in to the world which has taken the place of God in their life and has become their God. One day they will be judged. One day they will give an account for having brought discredit to the name of Christ by their actions and by their attitudes and the hurt that they have brought to others because of their self-centered focus in life that has replaced their first love for Jesus. So there are real Christians who have given into temptation and fallen into sin, who are bringing dishonor to God and are hurting others and are causing people to leave the church and to even leave God himself and come into agnosticism, well, prove to me God exists, or atheism, God doesn't exist at all. Now, that is an example of saints who are sinful and selfish. But there are also those within the church who are not of Christ at all whatsoever, who are Satan's secret agents within the church to destroy the church from within in who are actively serving Satan himself and are within the church to destroy it. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15, for such people are false apostles. Not everyone who calls himself an apostle is a real apostle. Deceitful workers, not everyone who works within the church is doing it for the glory of God masquerading as apostles of Christ, you will find there are people who call themselves Christians, who are not Christians, who have been sent there by the enemy of God, by Satan himself, have been sent within even churches to destroy those churches from within. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. So here Paul is saying that even within the church, there are those who are there for the sole reason of destroying the church from within and doing things that will discredit the name of Christ, doing things that will discredit the church itself. In Matthew 7, and verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Words are not enough. Many will say to me in that day, 
Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Here you see the fact of Jesus saying there will be people who have done miracles in his name, who have cast out demons in his name, who have prophesied in his name, who are not of him at all. Fake Christians, false Christians who are not of Christ, who are within the church. Be careful, be aware that not everyone who wears the name Christian is a real Christian, is the real deal. Some fall into sin, some are under total false advertisement. They're, they're secret agents. Satan has sent them within the church to destroy it. So people see these things happen, happening within the church. And they're either hurt themselves, they are victims of abuse by Christians or even leaders, or are being defrauded by those who call themselves Christians. And they use that hurt and that bitterness to not only reject the church, but to reject God Himself. Where is joy found? The following is quite instructive. Not in unbelief. Joy is not found in unbelief. Voltaire was a writer. He was someone who was totally opposed to God. He wrote, I wish I had never been born. So here is someone who was opposed to God. An atheist who said, I wish I had never been born. Lord Byron was a famous poet. So joy is not found in pleasure. He lived a life of pleasure, and he wrote, The worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. Jay Gould, who is an American millionaire, emphasizes that joy is not in money. He had plenty of money. When dying, he said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. Joy is not found in position and fame. Lord Beaconsfield, the Prime, Prime Minister of England, enjoyed more than his share of both position and fame, and yet he could write, youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, old age a regret. Joy is not found in military glory. Alexander the Great conquered the known world of his day, and yet he, having done so, he wept in his tent because he said, there are no more worlds to conquer. Where then is real joy found? The answer is simple. Real joy is found in Christ alone. Amen? Amen. In Christ alone. Well, this example is from the speaker's quote book by Roy Zuck. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 to 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 21. And this emphasizes our title. New life bringing new meaning. 2 Corinthians 5, 16-21 Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know Him in this way no longer. Therefore, verse 17, Therefore, since we're not focused on the flesh, we're not focused on surrendering to the world. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. In Christ, people are transformed and changed and become a new creation in Christ Jesus and are born again by the Spirit of God. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses or sins against them, and He has committed to us the world word of reconciliation. Therefore, talking about Christians who are genuine Christians, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God was making an appeal through us. 
We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Are you reconciled to God today? Are you lost in your sin? Have you shaken your fists at God? Have you denied God because of not wanting to be accountable to Him? Have you denied God because you've accused Him of suffering? Have you denied God because you've accepted the false claims of evolution? Have you denied God because you've been hurt by the church or by other Christians? Verse 21, he made him who knew no sin, talking about Jesus, to be sin on our behalf, on your behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We can be transformed and changed through a direct encounter with God through Jesus, the Prince of Peace, in becoming a follower of Jesus by acknowledging our self-centered sin, our corrupt our position where we deserve the judgment of God. When we come to recognize that we do not deserve to be received into the family of God, that no works that we do in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that salvation is a gift, not of works, at least any man would boast that we cannot earn our way to heaven by what we do. But if we acknowledge our corruption, if we acknowledge that we are not good, Romans 3 verse 12, there's no one good, not one. If we acknowledge that we are not good and our good work cannot earn our ticket to heaven, our way to heaven, but we can only come to Jesus who said in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the light, the only way to God the Father, that if we recognize that Jesus is who he said he was, that he is the only way to God the Father, that he can bring us eternal life through surrendering to him, acknowledging our sin, asking forgiveness, and, and becoming his follower, being transformed, being born again by the Spirit of God. If we acknowledge that, even if we have been in a position of denying the existence of God altogether, but the Holy Spirit has convicted our heart and we now realize and recognize that Jesus was who he said he was. And even now we can come to that point of surrender. I surrender all. Of surrender. Acknowledging the amazing grace of God. The surrender. I surrender all. If we come to that point of acknowledging that God exists, of acknowledging that Jesus was who he said he was, the Son of God, sent by God the Father in order to bring that that reconciliation as one who knew no sin and dying in our place on the cross as we will recognize later on in communion today if you recognize that fact you can receive the forgiveness of god instead of one day being under the judgment of god jesus can be your savior and your lord today but unless he becomes your Savior and Lord today, one day he will be your judge in the final white throne judgment in Revelation 20. And you have a choice of what will happen. Because in Revelation 20, it talks about the lake of fire, that if, if one's name is not written in the book of life, then one will go to the lake of fire. And how does one name get written in the book of life? It's based upon what you have done in this life, whether you have settled accounts with God, whether you have made peace with God through Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And that is the only way your name will be put within the book of life. So one day, if your name is not in the book of life, based upon what you have done in acknowledging God through faith in Jesus, if your name is not there, one day you will be eternally separated from God. You will be in that place, that lake of fire, that separation from God. But it is based upon what you have done. God does not send anyone to judgment. So here we see sin, suffering, science, saintlessness. All reasons God can use to not believe in God. All reasons people continually use to not believe in God. It is their choice, and the consequences are theirs to receive. Yet, we read in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the following, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you. God is patient with you, 
not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God, like with the case of Nineveh, God, out of mercy and love, provided a final opportunity for that city to make their peace with him before judgment would fall. God is providing you this opportunity to make your peace with him today. Because if you die today, not having made your peace with God, you will have denied the opportunity for your name to be written in the book of life. And you will be under the judgment of God. It is your choice. God patient. God is patient. He's patient with you. He's waiting, not wanting anyone to perish, not wanting you to perish, but for you to come to repentance. Elizabeth Elliot, whose husband died with others in their efforts in Ecuador to reach the Aka Indians. And she became a very well-known speaker. And I heard her at a missionary conference many years ago. She said the following, The fact is, as believers, it is not about us. It is not about my happiness, my joy, my well-being. It is about the glory of God and the kingdom of Christ. The only means to real joy and contentment is to make His glory the supreme objective in my life. Is the glory of God the objective in your life? Is that your supreme objective objective in your life? Or is your life focused on yourself? Colossians 1 and verse 27. It says, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is in Christ, in you, the hope of glory. Do you have that hope in Christ? The hope of glory. The the knowledge that the promises of God to the people of God will be fulfilled. Amen? They will be fulfilled. We have that eternal hope. The atheist, death ends everything. There is nothing more after death. There is no hope after death for the Christian. Death just ends this life. But eternity is just beginning. Christ in you, the hope of glory. New life brings new meaning. A new life in Christ brings new meaning. A new life in Christ brings hope, eternal hope, that nothing will take away. Amen? An atheist does not have that hope. This life is all there is. The end of this life, that's it. Finished. No hope beyond this life. We have as followers of Jesus Christ, that eternal hope. Are you a follower of Jesus today? Do you have that eternal hope? Or do you still believe that at death? That's it. Hebrews 9.27, it says, It's appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment. We have an appointed time. We will die. Unless Jesus comes back as he promised, we will die. Are you ready for his return? Are you ready to meet him when you die? Or are you still without hope? You can have that hope, a hope of glory, in Jesus through coming into that faith relationship with him today, right now. New meaning comes through new life in Christ. Do you have that new meaning? Do you have that eternal hope? Have you settled your peace with God? Through Jesus, the Prince of Peace, you can do it today. I'd just like to pray. Dear, dear Lord, I pray for anyone who's watching this now live or later on, who is separated from you, God, who has denied your existence up to this point, but the Holy Spirit has convicted their heart, and they realize that you, God, are real, and that Jesus is who he said he was, the Son of God who died in their place for their sins, and even now, They admit that they deserve God's wrath and judgment because of their sinful disobedience and their lack of accountability to Him. And I pray even now they will call out, O God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. I do not deserve your forgiveness. 
But I know you are a God of grace and mercy. I know that you sent your son Jesus to die in my place on the cross, and I surrender my life right now, my life that has been bought with a price. Jesus' death on the cross purchased my life. And I, I reach out to you, Lord, and I ask forgiveness, and I, and I ask that I, you come into my life. I surrender my life to you, what you have already done. I desire to follow Jesus, who will become the author and finisher of my faith. So I just pray, if you have done that today, that you will rejoice. It said the angels rejoice when one sinner, one person who is separated from God, comes into that faith relationship. So I pray that you may have taken that opportunity today. Because now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week, now. I pray for any of you who is watching this who has not taken that important step, the most important step you can ever take in this life. I pray that you will take this step today, even now. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. I also pray for those who are followers of Jesus, that they will live lives that are honoring to God by what they say and by what they do, that nothing will be so focused on themselves that they will turn people away from God. I pray, Lord, that you will help each of us who is your follower, not just living the label, but truthfully being a follower of Jesus Christ. I pray that we will have that desire day by day to faithfully live a life of obedience and of servanthood. And Lord, this life is so short. Help us to have our focus on Jesus, our hope of glory. The future promises that will be fulfilled. And these challenges that we face in this life are only for a short time compared to eternity. I pray, Lord, that you will encourage your believers listening to this today, that they will be uplifted, challenged, and strengthened as they look to you, Jesus, the hope of glory. I ask this in his precious name. Amen. I pray today that you have been challenged, encouraged, uplifted, and changed by the glory of God. So, we've had a message on commitment. We've had a message on the new meaning that comes to a new life in Christ, and now we can focus on Jesus, on his death on the cross, and what he did. In dying for us. So in reading from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, I hope some of you in having this little pause uh, between the message and communion were able to get the um, water or juice or crackers or bread ready uh, for communion. So reading 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, and we know that Jesus can come at any time. Be ready. So in communion, we celebrate and we remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And so we take the wafer or the crackers or the bread that you have, and we remember that body that was broken on the cross, where Jesus was so marred and broken and bruised that he was unrecognizable on the cross and all that physical torment and abuse he went through out of love for you and in obedience to God the Father. In memory of that, take and eat. Now, with one hand, I need help here. (laughs) Now, in memory of the blood, Jesus poured out his blood. You think of the famous hymn, there's power in the blood. His life force, he poured out his blood on the cross. 
for your sins, for the remission, the forgiveness of your sins, in remembrance of what Jesus did in dying for you. We take this juice, we take this water, we take what you have as a memory, as a symbol of what Jesus did on the cross in pouring out his blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Take, drink. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love for us. But even from the creation of the world, you prepared things in order for us to come into a relationship with you where we could recognize and acknowledge your love for us through sending your son Jesus to die for us on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that you have drawn us into your family through faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you that we have been able to acknowledge that we have that hope of glory that those who are atheists do not have. We thank you, Lord, and we desire to be more faithful day by day in following you. We ask in Jesus' precious name, amen. We thank God for the privilege we have to serve you and to be a means whereby you can grow in your faith in Christ or come to faith in Christ. May God have been glorified and may God have received all honor through this message today. So we thank God for the challenge we have in serving Christ, but we thank God that he gives us the resources to be victorious, to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, to be overcomers. Nothing is impossible because Philippians 4.13, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us in Matthew 28 and verse 20, that Jesus is with us even unto the end of the world. We are never alone. We have the strength and the presence of Jesus with us. And he said also that the Father has sent the Holy Spirit as the Counselor and the Helper. So we have not only the presence of Jesus, we have Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith. We have Jesus who is our mediator, who brings our prayer requests before God the Father and acts as our mediator. But we also have the Holy Spirit of God within us, our bodies, the temple of the Holy Spirit, to provide us that guidance and direction to whatever challenges we face day by day. Amen? So we should not live in defeat, but by the grace of God have the power and authority as we put on the full armor of God in Ephesians 6 to live in victory no matter what the challenges we face. And one day all of these challenges and difficulties will just be a dim memory because life is short. We thank God for the promises from his word which will never be broken. We praise God that he provides us the ability and the strength to be victorious no matter what we face in this life. Amen? Amen. Be victorious. Be encouraged. Be strengthened. Be faithful. No matter what you face in this coming day or weeks or months or whatever time that you have appointed in this earth, or even until Jesus comes again, may you be found faithful so that one day at the judgment seat of Christ, not the white throne judgment which is based on salvation, where those who are separated by their sin from God will face judgment, but the judgment seat of Christ where Christians will be called to give account for how faithful they've been in serving Him. I pray one day you will hear Jesus say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen? May you leave encouraged today. Be that shining light for Jesus, the light of the world. Shine for him today in someone's life. I asked in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And we will be back by the grace of God on Wednesday at 7 for the Bible study. And next Sunday at 11 as we continue to bring the word of god to you we thank you for having watched today having prayed for us today and may god's presence and power and provision and peace 
be more evident in your life daily. Goodbye for now. God bless you.